and seas, more spectacular, more mysterious than we could ever dream of. A place driven by light, a vast empire built by living organisms. Its canyons and chasms are home to the bizarre, the bold, and the beautiful. It beats with a pulse of life, and everywhere there is an ever-changing dazzle of color, pattern, and movement. beneath them create fantastic underwater gardens. Some like Persian carpets flung onto the seabed. Others like forests transported from outer space. Be prepared for surprises, because in this Alice in Wonderland world, nothing is as it seems. Animals masquerade as plants. There are fish that change sex when it suits. Flamboyant dual-sex snails who advertise their double appeal with multicolored abandon. Fish who try to disappear. In the blink of an eye, the shifting colors and shapes can blur what is real and what is imagined. The beauty, color, and pattern in all these creatures is also reflected in the color, pattern, and beauty of the entire Great Barrier Reef. A vibrant world running 2,000 kilometers along eastern Australia, built by millions, home to millions more. It is a wondrous natural world. And like all of nature, it is complex and hard. There is no guarantee of survival. Behind the veil of beauty, death awaits the unwary or the unlucky. Yet against all odds, life coexists, and like the reef itself, is reborn. Life is lived one day at a time, and each day can be a life. We are about to witness a very special day. The sun's rays are a signal. The night hunters grow lethargic and tuck themselves away, while the day feeders become more active. One of the earliest risers is the lionfish, already prowling languidly in dawn's dim light. Well armed against predators, with 13 poison-laden spines, it is a formidable hunter. Those long trailing fins not only disguise its approach, but also help the lionfish to herd its breakfast together. When it strikes, the end is startlingly quick. The little fish literally sucked up. But the speed, skill, and poison of the lionfish apparently don't impress the fearless little pufferfish. It niggles. It taunts. Until the lionfish can take no more, it snaps, then just as quickly spits the puffer out. It knows this annoying mouthful is not only poisonous, it's also likely to swell into a prickly ball if swallowed. So the pufferfish survives to tease another, while the lionfish waits for a less armored mouthful. But ultimately, the lionfish and all the reef creatures depend on the most unusual and interesting animal of all, the corals. Corals don't just live on the reef, they build it. Laying down layer upon layer of limestone, the corals have created this multi-dimensional world. There are more than 500 different coral species on the Great Barrier Reef, each with its own technique for survival. The plate coral is adept at the art of catching light. The fast-growing staghorn wins the race for space with branches spreading 15 centimeters a year. 
While the slow and steady brain corals may take 25 years to grow to human head size, but could be around for a hundred more. Corals are not typical animals. What we commonly call coral is really a colony of millions of tiny animals called polyps, which work together to build the complex structures of the reef. Each polyp is genetically identical to its neighbor, and all are carnivorous, crowned by a ring of stinging tentacles. At night, their bodies and arms reach out to feed on the microscopic plankton floating by. But during the day, these soft, vulnerable bodies are tucked away in their limestone skeletons, safe from predators. And they become more like plants. Tiny algae cells, which live in the polyp's flesh, work to turn the sunlight into energy and carbon dioxide from the water into their building blocks of limestone. This unique double life helps explain how such tiny creatures can create a reef so large that it is the only living thing that can be seen from outer space. Some corals are not builders, merely decorators. These soft corals thrive in the shadier parts of the reef, where their light-hungry hard coral cousins would fail. With no algae in their flesh to make limestone, their contribution to the reef is a deceptively fragile beauty. As the rising sun pierces the coral canyons, the polyps retreat before hungry predators arise. There is not long to wait before the sun catches flashes of color. For the day crowd moving in, being noticed is not so dangerous. Most of their predators hunt in the dim twilight when bright colors are dulled. But in the daylight, their colors and patterns are neon bright billboards advertising who they are, what sex they are, how mature and how aggressive. Quick recognition of these messages can mean life and death in such a crowded world. This small blue and black fish is a cleaner wrasse. One fish instantly recognized, even sought after by others on the reef. In a sort of aquatic barber shop, they offer passing clients a wash and brush up. It's a thorough going over. No scale unturned. Parasites and diseased skin are cleaned off. Meal time for the cleaner ass, while the client fish seems tickled by the attention. Each individual cleaner ass has its own station and is always busy. No fish is too strange, too small. Or too imposing. It boldly goes where no other fish would dare, adding dental hygiene to its chores even if the client is a predator like this potato cod. Accidents hardly ever happen. And gill cleaning is just an added extra. Even the normally ferocious moray eel ignores the cleaner wrasse as potential prey in order to get its makeover. Although not much could improve this sea monster look like. Some as small as a pen. Others as large as a cow. They keep most of their bodies tucked in coral tunnels and caves during the day, slithering out only at night to hunt using smell and taste, as the moray has very poor eyesight. As the sun rises higher in the sky, it is peak hour down below. More fish, more action as thousands of species bustle between their feeding grounds. The plant eaters search for algae pastures, the carnivores for bite-sized prey. It's a fish-eat-fish -fish world. Competition is rife, aggression is high, although some may have other things on their mind. 
One of the most aggressive is the damsel. Small in size, big in bluster, it's ready to take on anyone. A marine farmer protecting its algae pastures. Anyone eyeing off its crop gets short shrift indeed. The damsel, bristling with belligerence, is ever ready for a fight. Even the heavily armed surgeon fish is dispatched with ease. In complete contrast, the clownfish is protected by its territory, the poisonous stinging tentacles of this anemone. It's one of those strange relationships which exist on the reef. By mixing its mucus coat with that of the anemone, the clownfish tricks its host into thinking it is part of the anemone's own body. So the anemone tentacles don't sting the clownfish, and in return, the clownfish keep potential predators at bay. For year after year, the clownfish may never venture beyond the reach of its fleshy fortress. Mid-morning passes, the sun moves higher. The fish continue their day's work in relative calm, but on the surface, it is turmoil. The tide rushes out, its power batters and sculpts the reef, carving channels through the corals. The waters here are a rich soup of food and nutrients, swirling from the shallows to the reef's outer edges. And here await a myriad of hungry mouths. Amongst the first to help themselves are these exotic blooms, not flowers at all, but the gills of worms buried within the reef. As efficient as they are lovely, these gills both breathe and feed. Truly a magic carpet, they clean the water and return precious nutrients to the reef. Although they seem vulnerable, it takes only a shadow to make them disappear. Hungry arms, like the barnacles, appear from every nook. Sea cucumbers cast filigree nets. Crinoids, animals left over from dinosaur times, add their waving fronds. Very little food escapes. And any that does get through to the open sea will find monstrous appetites waiting. Whale sharks, the marine world's giants, cruise the currents beyond. Despite their massive size, they too are filter feeders. Pumping enough water to fill 5,000 swimming pools through their gills each day to siphon off enough tiny plankton to feed their 12 ton bodies. The rich tidal water is also an irresistible lunchtime invitation for the manta ray. This silent glider, with wings reaching up to 7 meters across, is an efficient feeder using two fins on either side of its mouth to scoop up the food and water. The sun is at its height, the tide at ebb. Much of the coral is left high and dry. A perfect time for herons and other shorebirds to pick up something for their lunch. While underwater, the coral uses the sun to create energy. On the surface, exposure to sunlight can mean death. But the reef has many survival strategies. Corals produce their own sun cream, 
a thicket of mucus to block the sun's rays. Nothing is wasted. As the tide returns, microscopic flatworms feed on that mucus. Seabirds wheel under the sun, scanning the warmed waters for fish to feed their hungry babies. But the blazing sun can kill a chick left in its nest, so adults take turns on umbrella duty. At midday, the pace is slow. Back below the surface, the reef is quiet. Divers descend beyond the reach of the midday sun. Their destination, a victim of the reef, a shipwreck. Over the past 100 years, the unfortunate vessel has been transformed into the very thing that destroyed it, a reef. A shadowy skeleton, now covered on every surface with all sorts of reef life. Corals, sponges, worms. Their larvae carried in by the currents to colonize this alien form. Fish find shelter under its bulk. Sea snakes probe the crevices. While an old barnacle-clad hawksbill turtle finds plenty here of interest, Its specialized beak means not even the toughest shell is safe. As the tide turns, the afternoon's activities begin. The day fish must feed as long as the light lasts before they themselves are fed upon. The bumphead parrotfish finds its food the hard way. They move in herds, crushing tons of coral rubble into sand with their powerful jaws. They are after the minute algae growing within the porous limestone of the coral. If left ungrazed, this algae would smother the reef. Each one, each day, processes many times its own weight of rubble, returning the pulverized coral as sand. This sand and rubble is not the wasteland it looks, but a fertile feeding ground for others, like the rock-moving wrasse, who literally leaves no stone unturned. The goatfish is equally diligent. Its searching is helped by chin barbels, not whiskers, but sensors, which probe the sand, allowing the goatfish to find and taste its food. Goatfish are such successful hunters that they are seldom left alone. Freeloaders like this sweet lip hang in the wings, ready to snatch at the leftovers. The sea cucumber is a less refined feeder. Like an industrial vacuum cleaner, it hoovers its way along the sea floor, using what it can, discarding the rest. Catfish prefer a more social approach to feeding. In a great tumbling mass, hundreds churn up the sand, a hungry black ribbon. Each one shifts place constantly as they trade off between safety and food. Safe but hungry in the middle, well-fed but vulnerable on the edge. While the butterfly fish prefers the quiet life, willing to take its chances with only its lifelong mate at its side to share the dangers, 
and the food. It's late in the afternoon before the shyest residents of the ocean floor emerge. These garden eels live in communities of up to 300. Each eel living alone in their own private burrow, feeding only on what passes by. They seldom leave home and always keep a wary eye out, ready to vanish. The goby and the shrimp are the reef's odd couple. The house-proud shrimp is always renovating their burrow, landscaping the surrounds. But the shrimp is blind. So the goby, like a guard dog with fins, keeps a watchful eye out for danger. The shrimp keeps its antenna on the goby, ready to retreat at the merest flick of the goby's fin. Other gobies are more orthodox, sticking to their own kind and mating for life. As the sun drops in the sky and the shadows grow, it signals danger for the day fish. Uneasy in the failing light, they stick to the shadows of the reef. And it's easy to see why. The predators of the twilight are gathering, watching, waiting. Trevally and small barracuda cruise, all in tight formation, moving and turning as one with liquid synchronicity. fish has a row of sensitive scales down its body to pick up on the slightest movements of their neighbors and replay it instantly. The ultimate in precision swimming. For small fish, the school offers the safety of numbers, the flickering of many individuals confusing the hunters, yet able to react as one. As the light dims, the danger grows. Even the large daytime fish gather together, but the predators are closing in. Called by their hunger, the sharks rise from the depths like deadly torpedoes. Once they've arrived, the balance shifts. The most dangerous time has come. Those who were hunters now become prey. Even the barracuda takes flight. Sharks hunt by smell, not sight, so schools don't confuse them. Throughout the wild melee, the parasitic remora hangs on tight. Other twilight predators join the feeding orgy. Trevally strike, herding panicked schools of bait fish with their thrashing jaws. In the confusion, an opportunistic tomato cod grabs his share, though it's more an ambush than an attack. The 
oriental robin flees the danger zone, spreading its fan-like fins as wide as possible, giving the impression of size to any potential predator. The rabbitfish dives for cover. Bite-sized treats like these humbugs vanish in a trice. Sticking close to homes, their eyesight fails in the dimming light. Vertical razorfish hang about upside down, doing their utmost to blend into the surrounds. It's change over time on the reef, as unsettling as the dawn, and as dangerous. While those awake all day seek out a place to sleep, the night feeders begin to prowl. In the skies above, the seabirds too head for home. A chance to rest as the calm of a velvet dusk falls. But no such calm below the waves. Driven by a force stronger than their fears, fish will risk death for the chance to mate. It's now that the parrotfish gather to breed. The oncoming night gives their offspring the best chance to survive so they risk the danger of the twilight prowlers to spawn. Parrotfish leave a lot to luck, releasing milky clouds of sperm and eggs to find each other in the shifting waters. fish are far more practical and careful. The male guards the eggs. He cleans them, even fans them in their tentacle nurseries, with up to 350,000 eggs anchored on these sticky tendrils. The clownfish is no ordinary father. In fact, it's no ordinary fish. The he tending the eggs today could become a she in three weeks if the current egg-laying female dies. Or, if the current he dies, then the next male in line quickly matures. For a fish that seldom leaves the safety of its home, this is its one way of ensuring there will always be one of each sex ready to breed. The cuttlefish is just as careful about her eggs. She places them delicately. Then guards them without rest or food until they finally hatch, and then she dies. The ultimate parental sacrifice. Nightfall, the moon rises and takes over as the driving force on the reef.
minute plankton rise up through the water and the coral polyps come out to feed, stretching out their finger-like tentacles to catch the passing plankton. While the coral feeds, the daytime fish sleep, a dangerous state to be in. The parrotfish expels a mucus shroud to wrap itself, a protective cocoon masking its scent from predators. As the daytime fish disappear, an amazing array of unearthly creatures roll, creep and crawl out into the darkness. The reef's hidden faces look out, spying on creatures never seen by daytime divers. The octopus glides about with newfound assurance in the darkness, displaying its skill at disguise. Its skin is filled with bags of pigment called chromatophores which can change color and texture as fast as the octopus can move. Remarkable for a colorblind creature. The cuttlefish is another colorblind camouflage expert. Sharp eyes, sharp reflexes and good disguises make it a formidable hunter. With gills on their backs, sex organs on their heads, and 600 glorious costumes, these nudibranchs are truly bizarre. A far cry from their land relatives, the snail. And while they lack shells, they're certainly not defenseless, armed instead with poisons capable of taking the skin off a person's hand. Their electric beauty advertises this toxic cargo to any potential predator. Although they keep their colors hidden in the reef caves by day, venturing out only at night. The moon is just past full, and so is the tide. A female turtle appears on the beach, where she herself was born many years ago. Driven by time and instinct, she has returned to lay her eggs. It's an arduous business on land. Her shell weighs heavily without the help of water, Breathing is difficult. The temperature of the sand will determine what sex her babies will be. At this time of year, most will be male. So unlike her, they will not have to make the journey back. As she swims away, Having sealed her egg chamber, humans arrive, here to witness a once-a-year miracle. This puffer takes a dim view of these interlopers in his dark world, but it's not him they've come to seek out.
With the moon five days past full and the waters warmed by the spring, the reef itself prepares for birth. As midnight comes, the coral polyps stop feeding, a pregnant pause, and then it begins. Eggs and sperm cast adrift into the tropical night. Slowly at first, rising like precious balloons, then more and more join in until all across the reef new life emerges. Incredibly, each species spawns simultaneously around the same time each year. In some corals, there are separate male and female colonies, one producing sperm and the other eggs, to come together, fusing in the warm water. species, the same polyp produces both. The coral larvae may float on the currents for days or months. Those that survive will settle and a single polyp will be the start of a new reef. spawns, others join the orgy. Somber sea cucumbers rise and sway till they climax. While nudibranchs cavort with abandon. Each is both male and female, with genitals front and back. The possibilities are endless. Two, three, up to 15 can join in their mating game. of polychaete worms writhe in the sea of spawn. The packages of polyp eggs hover in the water like stars in the skies above. As they rise, they separate, the tracking sperm following the scent trails of their own kind of eggs. If an egg is fertilized within four hours of spawning, it will still take another day to become a free-swimming larvae, but an enormous amount of luck is needed for this new life to survive that long. As the dawn comes, so do the hungry hordes, ready to gorge themselves on the huge slick of spawn. Most of it will be eaten, but the reef is so prolific, the spawn so vast, that enough will be fertilized, enough will escape hungry jaws to survive and grow.
It's only because of their numbers that any survive to grow and breed for the next hundred years or more. Whether it's turtles or coral spawn, nature's odds are tough. But the reef and its creatures have survived those odds for thousands of years. If nature's balance is kept, they should survive for thousands more. There is a place under the southern seas more spectacular, more mysterious than we could ever dream of. A place driven by light. A vast empire built by living organisms. Its canyons and chasms are home to the bizarre. The bold. And the beautiful. It beats with the pulse of life. And everywhere, there is an ever-changing dazzle of color, pattern, and movement. Animals anchored to the rocks beneath them create fantastic underwater gardens. Some, like Persian carpets, flung onto the seabed. Others like forests transported from outer space. Be prepared for surprises, because in this Alice in Wonderland world, nothing is as it seems. Animals masquerade as plants. There are fish that change sex when it suits. Flamboyant dual-sex snails who advertise their double appeal with multicolored abandon. They should try to disappear. In the blink of an eye, the shifting colors and shapes can blur what is real and what is imagined. The beauty, color, and pattern in all these creatures is also reflected in the color, pattern, and beauty of the entire Great Barrier Reef. A vibrant world running 2,000 kilometers along eastern Australia, built by millions, home to millions more. It is a wondrous natural world. And like all of nature, it is complex and hard. There is no guarantee of survival. Behind the veil of beauty, death awaits the unwary or the unlucky. Yet against all odds, life coexists, and like the reef itself, is reborn. Life is lived one day at a time, and each day can be a life. We are about to witness a very special day. The sun's rays are a signal. The night hunters grow lethargic and tuck themselves away, while the day feeders become more active. One of the earliest risers is the lionfish, already prowling languidly in dawn's dim light. Well armed against predators, with 13 poison-laden spines, it is a formidable hunter. Those long trailing fins not only disguise its approach, but also help the lionfish to herd its breakfast together. When it strikes, the end is startlingly quick. The little fish literally sucked up.
But the speed, skill, and poison of the lionfish apparently don't impress the fearless little pufferfish. It niggles. It taunts. Until the lionfish can take no more, it snaps. Then just as quickly spits the puffer out. It knows this annoying mouthful is not only poisonous, it's also likely to swell into a prickly ball if swallowed. So the pufferfish survives to tease another, while the lionfish waits for a less armored mouthful. But ultimately, the lionfish and all the reef creatures depend on the most unusual and interesting animal of all, the corals. Corals don't just live on the reef, they build it. Laying down layer upon layer of limestone, the corals have created this multi-dimensional world. There are more than 500 different coral species on the Great Barrier Reef, each with its own technique for survival. The plate coral is adept at the art of catching light. The fast-growing staghorn wins the race for space with branches spreading 15 centimeters a year. While the slow and steady brain corals may take 25 years to grow to human head size, but could be around for a hundred more. Corals are not typical animals. What we commonly call coral is really a colony of millions of tiny animals called polyps, which work together to build the complex structures of the reef. Each polyp is genetically identical to its neighbor, and all are carnivorous, crowned by a ring of stinging tentacles. At night, their bodies and arms reach out to feed on the microscopic plankton floating by, but during the day, these soft, vulnerable bodies are tucked away in their limestone skeletons, safe from predators. And they become more like plants. Tiny algae cells, which live in the polyp's flesh, work to turn the sunlight into energy and carbon dioxide from the water into their building blocks of limestone. This unique double life helps explain how such tiny creatures can create a reef so large that it is the only living thing that can be seen from outer space. Some corals are not builders, merely decorators. These soft corals thrive in the shadier parts of the reef, where their light-hungry hard coral cousins would fail. With no algae in their flesh to make limestone, their contribution to the reef is a deceptively fragile beauty. As the rising sun pierces the coral canyons, the polyps retreat before hungry predators arise. There is not long to wait before the sun catches flashes of color. For the day crowd moving in, being noticed is not so dangerous. Most of their predators hunt in the dim twilight when bright colors are dulled. But in the daylight, their colors and patterns are neon bright billboards advertising who they are, what sex they are, how mature and how aggressive. Quick recognition of these messages can mean life and death in such a crowded world. This small blue and black fish is a cleaner ras. One fish instantly recognized, even sought after by others on the reef. In a sort of aquatic barber shop, they offer passing clients a wash and brush up. It's a thorough going over. No scale unturned. Parasites and diseased skin are cleaned off. Meal time for the cleaner ass, while the client fish seems tickled by the attention.